Wow. Thank you so much, Youth Band. Do y'all have a name, or is it Youth Band? Ignite. 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 Well, I know. Ignite. Let's give thanks for them uh, this morning. I tell you, man. I mean, you all know, as like parents and adults and grandparents, we kind of, we're, we're uh, commanded to encourage you, but that was, that was awesome. I mean, seriously, they have um, like um, gone from uh, just kind of playing some songs nice as a group of teenagers to uh, a cohesive worship band leading us in worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, and I don't say that lightly, so I'm thankful for that, the way God's poured into you. And I know we have some adults here that have let God use them to pour through, like Will Ryan has worked with the, you guys for a long time and uh, just really thankful this morning. So glad you all could be here today as we worship together. If you happen to be visiting from uh, some distance from here, we're especially glad you're here this morning as well. Uh, thinking of the youth as well, just lift up Megan Brown, our Director of Youth Ministries in your prayers. Megan has been under the weather a bit. I know she was at the hospital last night. I'm not sure what the exact status is right now, but lift her up in prayer that... Uh, as she is uh, recovering. And uh, today we are looking at uh, uh, a passage from Acts chapter 5, titled it uh, Counterculture Thanksgiving. Countercultural Thanksgiving. So let's dig in. The jam group got dismissed, right? Sometimes I overlook that. All right, all right, good. Acts 5, looking at verse 39, says this. So they took his advice... And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. That was a tough day. And charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. May God bless the reading and hearing of these holy words. Let's pause for prayer and ask God to bless this time. Lord, as we gather today, so thankful, Lord, that you've allowed us to be here today. You've provided this place. In fact, you provide everything. And so, Lord, today, as we are focusing on being thankful, may we uh, be thankful when we see clearly the blessings and what you're doing in our lives. But Lord, may we also be thankful, especially when we may not see clearly why things are happening, and we're called to trust in you. We thank you, Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so how was your Thanksgiving? Are we, uh, I always forget what that's called when you eat the turkey and you get sleepy. You know, I know there's some, like, official term for that. What, what's it called? tryptophan in the turkey causes you to be kind of sleepy yeah. yeah okay good now i know we had some leftovers but by now sunday morning that's should you all I'm, I'm assuming everyone's awake so did you enjoy what turkey what are the traditional things dressing and stuffing i always thought stuffing was like a southern thing and dressing was like a northern thing but i heard on tv this week that that it's the other way around so yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why that is, but it is. So I'm always learning, no matter how old I get. Always learning. Uh, what else? Traditional stuff, mashed potatoes, pumpkin pie. One of our family members said, you know, technically this should be called squash pie. That, I don't think that sounds nearly as appetizing, so we'll stick with pumpkin pie. And then, do you all have, to me, this is like the pork and sauerkraut of New Year's Eve, which in case you didn't know, you're supposed to eat a bite of pork and sauerkraut for good luck in the new year. Now, as followers of Jesus, we, we don't adhere to superstitions, but we have fun with them. And to me, the, the cranberry stuff that still looks like the can when you open it and you eat a slice of it, that's like the traditional cri uh, Christmas. Uh, well, Christmas too. Thanksgiving thing, you got to eat. And I actually do kind of like it. Although someone explained to me that Jello contains like... Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Just enjoy the cranberry Jello, And yeah, so what? It looks like a can. You know, all God's creatures look like something. All right, there we go. You know, no question about it, we are thankful and we should be thankful for those things that we are so bountifully provided here in these communities where we live. And the takeaway for today is, this isn't a rocket science one, but it's good to keep in mind and live, and that is this, it's good to give thanks to not take for granted the blessings that God has given you. So may you and I be faithful to do that because I, I did read that according to the Food Aid Foundation, there's approximately 795 million people in the world that do not have enough food to eat. 
And so that's about one out of nine people in the world. So if you're among the eight out of nine, and my hunch is we probably all are among the eight out of nine that we have enough to eat, then let's be thankful for that. And also consider the ways that we can help, actively help those who are among those who don't have enough to eat. You know, four times in the Old Testament book of Psalms, we have this verse. <laughs> oh man. Timing is everything. <laughs> All right, focus. Four times in the Old Testament book of Psalms, we have the phrase, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. There's been songs written about that. We say that a lot. In fact, that's probably one of those phrases that's almost become cliche. So may you and I, when we talk about meditating upon the scriptures, it means stop, stopping and focusing and thinking about what is God saying to me? And am I actually living that way? Am I giving thanks to the Lord? Because he is good and his love does endure forever. Um, because I figure if God's gonna include something four times in the Psalms, then that's probably something that we should pay attention to. Now, we typically are thankful when things go the way that we want them to go, right? Well, that makes sense, exactly. Whoa, a little bit of audience participation today. I think I recognize that voice. <laughs> We're thankful when our relationships go well, when you're uh, beginning to date, beginning to at age 24, just so y'all know, that's when you're allowed to begin. Y'all didn't know that's a church policy, so talk to me later if uh, moms and dads voted on it. But if it's going well, you're thankful. If in your marriage relationship it's going well, you're obviously thankful. Uh, this time of year, sometimes we see children, small ones and grown ones, and if that relationship is going well, children, grandchildren, of course we're thankful. We're thankful when our job or, or things at school are going well. I got a raise. I got a promotion. I got a bonus. Thank you, Lord. We're thankful with our stuff. Uh, things like, wow, you, sh you should see the clarity of the new TV, right? What is it? 4K now is one of the things now with televisions. And, and when we get a new car, wow, you know, wow, we're thankful. It, these days, a cell phone. I mean, uh, man, that's an interesting one as far as the whole cell phone thing. But we're thankful. Sometimes we're even thankful for crazy, you might even say somewhat silly things, but when our football teams do what we had hoped they would do. I know. You know, I saw this at 8.30 and it was silent. And I looked at uh, Scott McGregor, you can tell him this, and there was not a smile on his face. And so I'm thinking, uh, one, of my rel one of my close relatives says, uh, it's too soon, Dad, it's too soon. In fact, video person, are we able to show the other two pictures that I had ready just in case? No, we're not. Okay, well, just trust me, I was ready either way. But uh, go gentle on the uh, team you were not cheering for. Jesus desires, you could even say that Jesus expects us to give thanks. And this picture here is a portrayal of... Um, in Luke chapter 17, beginning of verse 11, we have a passage in which Jesus was, he was headed to Jerusalem, but he was still quite a ways north, walking between Galilee and Samaria. Again, around Jerusalem was the country of Judah, where Jewish people lived, and then up in Galilee, up in the north, where Jesus grew up, and kind of between there, there was Samaria, and these were a group of people that were um, despised by the Jewish people, because their, their uh, ancestors had um, gotten married and had children with people of pagan religions, so they were considered like they had sold out, that sort of thing, which we know is not true, because whoever you are, you can always come to God. But anyway, so Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. He's starting to walk between Galilee, where he grew up, and Samaria, and he encounters 10 men who were lepers, and it says they were at a distance. And because they were at a distance, we know they had been, they'd probably been to the priest and when a person had a skin disease, like leprosy, they would go to the priest, and the priest would declare them unclean, and they were required then to live apart from everyone else. And in fact, if they saw people coming near them who did not have leprosy, they had to shout out, unclean, unclean. And so that's how they lived their lives. It could be a very lonely existence. And Jesus was walking, and 10 men who had leprosy saw him, and they cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And we, we learned that Jesus told them to go and, and uh, show yourself to the priest. Well, that could really only mean one thing, because since they had that distance, they had probably already been to the priest, 
And so to go back, you were, you were required to go back if you thought you had experienced healing and the priest would declare you clean. And so when Jesus said that, that was an indicator that something was gonna be happening. And we learned they were walking there and they looked and all of a sudden they realized that they had been completely healed. And one of the 10 turned around and came back and we're told he gave praise to God and he fell at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he'd done, which was good and right. But Jesus said, weren't there 10 of you? you know, where are the other nine? And it's interesting, Luke it says, this one that came back was from Samaria. Again, those despised people. And even Jesus says, he says, we're not 10 cleansed, where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And I can't help but think that Jesus, because we know Jesus would never say something to be malicious or spiteful or derogatory. So I wonder if Jesus emphasized this foreigner because, because this man was a Samaritan. Perhaps the others were from Galilee. And, and as if Jesus is saying, the other nine, they should have known better. I, I mean, they should have known to give thanks to God, to stop and return and give thanks. And so Jesus is saying, it's important to give thanks. So when something goes the way you want it to, don't get so caught up with yourself that you forget to give thanks to the giver of gifts. In fact, what do we do with children, particularly young children? When someone gives them a gift and we're kind of getting into that time of year, I often hear a mom or dad say, what do you say? What do you say? It's about time. No, you say, thank you. you know, is this it? No, you say thank you, right? And we, we repeat that over and over again so that being thankful can be a part of who we are. So we're thankful when we receive gifts that we enjoy, that we appreciate, these physical gifts, but would we still be thankful and praise God without those things in our lives? There's a great example of a couple who gave thanks to God even when things were, were confusing or very difficult. Uh, his name was Pastor Richard Wormbrand. His wife's name was Sabina. There's a picture of them from years ago. Pastor Wormbrand left his apartment uh, in Romania uh, on a February morning, uh, Sunday morning in 1948. But he didn't make it to church that day uh, because he was kidnapped off the streets by the Romanian secret police. And he would spend the next 14 years in a communist prisons. In fact, at one point during his time of being incarcerated, he came down with tuberculosis and it appeared that he was going to die. And so the guards of the prison moved him to a certain unit called the death cell, expecting him to die any day. But that wasn't God's plan at that time. And he didn't die, he got well. And eventually he was ransomed out of Romania. And after arriving in the West, he began to tell not just his story, but his story of the many Christians that were still suffering in these communist prisons behind what was called the Iron Curtain. And in October of 1967, those stories were typed up and they were mailed out to Christians who wanted to know more and be active in helping uh, people who were being persecuted for the faith. And, and in that October 1967, that was the first issue of a newsletter called VOM, a Voice of the Martyr. And that's a ministry today, which still goes on. In fact, today, the, the ministry that Richard and S Sabina Wormbrand founded is actively helping Christians in 68 countries, providing direct aid to the persecuted, sending Bibles to those in hostile areas and restricted nations, and assisting the frontline workers in those countries, telling the story of those persecuted for Christ. And so you never know what God is uh, sometimes up to but we always know that we can be thankful for what God is doing, even in the difficult times in our lives. So let's consider briefly again the passage from the book of Acts chapter five that I read just a couple moments ago. Just to kind of set the context a little bit, this was shortly after Jesus had ascended into heaven and the Christian church had begun. And we know the apostles were sharing about Jesus. And it was, it was interesting in the, um, the Sanhedrin, which was the religious leadership uh, of the Jewish faith in the, in the area of Jerusalem, there were Pharisees and there were Sadducees. It's kind of like we have denominations today, Baptists and Methodists and all that. One of the things about the Sadducees is they, they were just adamant that there, was, that there is no resurrection of the dead. 
And one of the things the apostles of Jesus first spread about Jesus was that Jesus had resurrected from the dead and that he promised that same resurrection to any that follow him and receive God's forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Well, this infuriated the Sadducees, the religious leaders, and so they had them thrown into prison. But we read in Acts uh, 4 that an angel came and set them free and basically said, keep up the good work, keep up what you're doing. And so they were freed, but the, um, the religious leaders went to get them, but they weren't there, but they found them and they brought them together. And they were having kind of a discussion about what are we going to do with these apostles? We've got to stop this. And there was one of the leaders in, the, uh, one of the religious leaders, his name was Gamaliel, Gamaliel. He was on the, on the Sanhedrin. Um, at least I'm assuming that, he, because he was highly respected by the council. And he said, he spoke and they listened to what he had to say. And it's interesting, I can't help but think that he um, may have had a heart for God saying, Lord, I, I don't understand what you're doing, but help us to see more clearly. And this is what he said. He says, you know what? I think we better be careful with what we're doing with these apostles. He says, as you know, there have been men before them who have had followings that have kind of uh, risen up. And, but then, uh, and he mentions Thaddeus was one name, I believe. And then Judas of Galilee uh, was another one. And they had a group of about 400, but the leader was killed and the group just kind of fell away. And, and he said that, he said that, um, we need to be careful. And he put it this way in verse 38. He said, so in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. And so the religious leaders took his advice. They brought the apostles in again. They gathered them together and they had them beaten again. And then they let him go. But they charged them to stop teaching, stop speaking about Jesus and this resurrection of the dead. And it says this in verse 41. It says, then they left the presence of the council, these are the apostles, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And it says that every day in homes and in the temple uh, did not stop preaching and teaching that the Christ is Jesus. Now, we're told by the Apostle Paul and others to be obedient to your authorities, but if it comes to be a conflict, and Peter says this, it's either Acts, I think it's Acts chapter three. Peter says to these religious leaders, he says, if we have to choose between being obedient to man or being obedient to God, we always have to choose God. When the two are in conflict, it's always nice when the two are harmonious. But when they're in conflict, we have to choose to be obedient to God. So they kept teaching and preaching in the temples and then also from home to home. Can you imagine what it would be to live that way, knowing that if you keep sharing your faith in God through Jesus Christ, that you might be arrested, put in prison, possibly even executed. I mean, what would it look like for you and I to live today as followers of Jesus here where we live and give thanks to him no matter what. In our case, at least currently, we're probably not gonna be arrested and put in jail because of our faith, but certainly we experience suffering in our lives. Certainly we have illness at times that we don't understand why it's happening. We have things like being laid off from our job. What would it look like to give thanks to God even when those things are happening? Not that we don't acknowledge that it's difficult and we're perhaps confused or wondering why, Lord, but to say, thank you, Lord, I trust you when things are not clear to me as to how they're going. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount spoke of this. He said, and it's in Matthew 5, he said, blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He says, rejoice and be glad. In other words, give thanks for your reward is great in heaven. That's important, keep that in mind. Your reward is great in heaven. Uh, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He's saying rejoice and be glad. This happens to God's people. It has happened throughout the generations. You know, he says people are gonna revile, persecute, and utter all kinds of evil against you. Those of you who know me pretty well know my vocabulary is less than expansive, so I looked up the word revile. I mean, I had a the idea from the context, but here, just so your word of the day, you can know, revile means to criticize in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. So sometime in the near future, you may say, I'd really appreciate it if you'd stop reviling me, right? I, I mean, doesn't that sound so natural? No, not really. 
Well, what's Jesus doing? Why is Jesus promoting a response to being slandered that goes against the norm of the culture? I mean, who gives thanks when they're treated in such a way? It's countercultural. And he seemed to do that a lot. In Luke chapter 6, beginning of verse 27, Jesus gives this whole list of things as far as, here's my directives, here are my commands for you. And you know, in John 15, he says, if you love me, obey my commands. I don't know about you, but there are certain commands. I remember them, you know, love one another, be kind to children, all that sort of thing. I got those, Jesus. But there are certain ones, like here in Luke 6, that I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, those aren't quite as fresh on my mind. Let me read them off. He says this, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to one who strikes you on the cheek, off of the other side, and from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And finally, he says, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. So there it is. He's saying, these are the, this, is the, this is the community you are. These are the things that God wants you to do. So based on these commands of Jesus, let's do a quick check of how, how we're doing. Give yourself, okay, there are nine of those. I'm going to read them off real quick. You can either make a mark in your bulletin or just remember in your head. There's nine of them. You get 10 points total. My, one of my teachers used to say, you get one point if you spell your name right. So there we are. Yeah, y'all got that. So I'm going to read these off. And as I do so, kind of do a self-examination. And if you need help, there might be someone close to you that knows you well, got to know you really well. And you'll know if they would say, yes, she, or yes, he, yeah, that's normally something you do or not and see how many points you get. All right, so here we go. Number one, love my enemies. Mm -hmm. Number two, do good to those who hate me. Number three, bless those who curse at me. Number four, pray for those who abuse me. Number five, after, after hitting me once, let them hit me again, and that's without hitting them back. Number six, give them my gloves and my hat after they stole my coat. Hey, wait, you forgot something. Uh, give to, uh, number seven, give to everyone who begs from me. This is where Jesus bugged me because if it was give to some people who beg from you, I would like that better and that would work out better than give to everyone who begs from me. Number eight, let them keep the stuff that they stole from me. And number nine, do to others as you wish they do to you. I'm like, oh man, okay, I got one, got one. So how'd you do? I mean, wouldn't it be fair to say that these commands are counter to our culture? In fact, sadly, so often they're counter to my personal culture. And might we say, Jesus, this is not realistic. I mean, who do you think we are? Well, 2,000 years ago, there must have been somebody, I think, that either said that or he knew what they were thinking because he says this. He says in verse 32, if you love those who love you, well, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Countercultural thanksgiving. You know, I can't help but picture Jesus saying, what, did, did you think being a disciple of mine was going to be easy? In John 15, 18, he says, if the world hates you, just know that it has hated me before it hated you. Because remember, Jesus' followers are looking at eternity. This is a key. He said, right, your rewards are in heaven. And if that wasn't a reality, then there wouldn't be that much you know, to live for. But he's saying your rewards are in heaven. And so I think I said this a few weeks ago, don't get eternity amnesia if you're a follower of Jesus. What Jesus offers is eternal. The, the world is offering nice things, but it's that which will, as the Bible says, things that will rust or decay or just simply be forgotten over time. And there's no way that you and I can faithfully live as Jesus has directed if we only focus on the things of this world. All right. So you and I are called to live eternally, and all this is well and good, but how do we put this into action? I have four suggestions, recommendations, challenges for you this morning as to how we can give thanks. 
How do we as disciple makers not just hear the word of God, but put it into practice? Here are four ways, things that you and I can do. Undoubtedly, there are others, but here's four for a start. First of all, to put your faith into action and give thanks, just simply go and serve, go and serve. Jesus said in Matthew 25, he says, when you feed somebody who's hungry, when you give someone something to drink who's thirsty, when you bring a nice warm coat for someone who's cold in these winter days, he's saying, it's like you're doing it for me. So one way is we can give thanks to the Lord is simply go and serve. Secondly, step out in boldness about your faith. Now we have to be careful about this. We don't wanna step out in arrogance. We don't wanna be conceited. We, don't want, we want, uh, the faith in God to be attractive as it should be. But one of the ways we can give thanks is we think about Jesus in John uh, chapter you know, 10, 10, John 10, 10, he says, I've come that you may have life and have life in abundance. He says, yeah, that's, that is part of why I came. I want you to experience the life that God's offering. It's an abundant life. And so one of the things we can do to give thanks is to talk about that. I give thanks to God for my life in Jesus Christ. And here's some of the ways that I experience that he's blessing me. You know, one of the, one of the cool things that happened last week was, you know, the baptism when uh, Teddy was baptized. And it's interesting, the, the ripple effect that that has had. I've had just so many people say, you know, what a, what a powerful witness. Just not the actual, not just the actual baptism, but the words that she and Jane shared. It, it, you just never know when you just kind of share what God is doing in your life with a spirit of thanksgiving, how that, that can become contagious. You know, we see this even in the secular world, pay it forward, right? Well, God kind of, God invented the, the original pay it forward. A third way we can give thanks is to pray for those who are persecuted. Last Sunday, we had um, a woman who shared about a particular school in India, and she shared about how some of the Christians in India are being uh, persecuted, and so we can pray for them. We know um, that we have brothers and sisters in the Republic of the Congo that are persecuted, and in the Middle East, and in China. And so let's be intentional every day to pray for those who are being persecuted. And listen carefully also as you pray, because God undoubtedly will then begin to call you and me to take action as well, to help with that. And then finally, fourth, a way we can give thanks is simply to worship and give thanks no matter what. Because the truth is, we all have hardships, right? We know this. I imagine every person here either has experienced cancer or a serious illness, or certainly knows of someone who has or is. Many, many folks, you know, myself included, at times in marriage, you have ups and you have downs. Other relationships as well. We know in our job and at school, sometimes there are challenges. We know financial stress as well. God's calling us to worship and give thanks, even when things are particularly difficult. Yesterday, I went and saw a friend of mine, uh, Jim Smith. He has the Smoothie King down here. Jim's been going through kind of a challenging time in his life. And, and, and I would value your prayers for him and his wife, Susan. Um, but one thing is, as we talked, he said, you know, Doug, I don't understand all that's, that's going on here. Um, but I, knew, I do know that, that God, God still loves me. And he talked about how the people that have reached out to him, and that's how he knows, that's how he's reminded that God loves him because God's people are reaching out. So may you and I be faithful to do that. God gave us many examples. The classic is what, Job in the Old Testament? He says, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I don't understand it, but I still will trust in God. Peter, when, when Jesus said to Peter, so do you wanna to leave too? Peter says, Lord, to whom else would I go? Lord, you, you're it. You're the one I'm sticking with you through thick and thin. Man, and this time of year as we get closer to Advent and Christmas, can you believe it that it's that time of year? Mary, the mother of Jesus, was told, here she was, what, probably a teenager, uh, engaged, not yet married, and she learns from the angel Gabriel, you're gonna be pregnant, you're gonna have the Son of God, and what does she say? She says, as she kind of takes it in, she says, I'm the servant of the Lord. In other words, wow, I didn't see this one coming, but I'll, I'll give thanks and trust in God. So as we wrap up today, I know today's the day of miracles, I tell you, we're, we're ending early. So uh, as we, I, I told some people it could happen. So as we wrap up today, 
If the band wants to come back up, here's how I'd like to uh, pray before we uh, sing our closing song. Let's, uh, uh, two specific uh, modes of prayer. One is, um, let's give thanks to God for something that's just an obvious blessing in our life. It can be one thing, it can be more than one thing. Let's be thankful to God. You can say some things out loud if you want, or whisper, sign it, whatever works for you. We'll pray for that. And then secondly, think about something that is difficult in your life, that's just a challenge. Maybe you understand it, maybe you don't. And let's give thanks for the fact, let's give thanks to God that he will be with us, that he'll walk with us, that, he, that we can trust in him even when things are not the way we wish them to be. So let's, let's do that, let's pray. God, as we come to you here today, oh yeah, if anyone wants to kneel at the kneeling rails, I'm trying to get in the habit of saying that every week that I can just become the norm, but sit, kneel, stand, lay down, whatever. God, as we come to you here today, we thank you, Lord. We have so much to be thankful for. I mean, it's pretty evident, it's pretty obvious, Lord. Some of the, the air we breathe, where we live, uh, we're surrounded here by friends today. Even if you're here the first time today, I want you to know that you are surrounded by those who may not know you yet, but they love you. And so we're thankful, Lord, for family and for friends. It's a time of year where we, we call it Thanksgiving, Lord, and we are guilty of so often living day to day, just kind of taking for granted all the blessings you pour out to us. And so, Lord, forgive us for that. And Lord, hear our prayers of Thanksgiving as we thank you. I'm gonna pause here for just a second. And this morning, I encourage you all, think of some specific things for which you're thankful. God, as we look at the whole realm of life, as you're certainly aware, there are things in our life that are challenging, and difficult, frustrating, confusing. Lord, for relationships that are perhaps somewhat fractured right now, we do pray, Lord, for reconciliation. And may we praise you and trust in you through the times of challenge. Lord, when we think of whether it's ourself or those close to us experiencing a particular illness, Lord, we do, of course, pray for healing, Lord. But I pray, Lord, we, we thank you in the sense that you're with us through the times of illness. And Lord, any other things this morning that as we gather here today, they're on our mind, on our heart. May we place them at the, at the foot of the cross, give them to you, and trust that you have been with us, you are with us, you will be with us. We pray, Lord, you would, you'd speak to us and you'd help us to understand more and, and see more clearly. But even when the journey, Lord, might seem kind of cloudy or <clears throat> misunderstood or confusing, Lord, may we continue to walk with you. You told us, Lord, yea, uh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death even, that you're with me. And so we trust that today. Lord, I pray when the time comes for us to go from here and we go back to homes and some are probably traveling some distances and we'll go back to our jobs and back to school. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill us and be with us so that we would reveal a spirit of thanksgiving and hope to others around us. Let it be contagious, Lord. For all the days that we're here on earth, and then we look forward, Lord, to one day as we continue in eternity of celebrating with you. Jesus, we pray all these things, and we do give you thanks. Amen. Amen.